New Mexico is uh, central in uh, the world of nuclear weapons and the future of nuclear weapons. We are, uh, as the title of a recent book has it, not just the land of enchantment, we are the land of nuclear enchantment. And that belief system or cult uh, has a lot to do, I will say, and we can return to this in the second part of the uh, discussion this evening, has a lot to do with our, the fact that we end up at the bottom of every social, economic, and uh, list. So, Los Alamos is also the only place in the United States that can make plutonium pits the cores of nuclear weapons. Well, I say can make them. Actually, they can't right now. Um, they haven't been able to for a few years, and they won't be making any plutonium pits for the stockpile for a few years. Los Alamos has a lot of problems, and we'll get into that. But um, it has been difficult for the laboratory to run a consistent, reliable, continuous plutonium program. In fact, um, there's a lot of people in Washington that are quite fed up with Los Alamos. So the picture we get here is one of the laboratory, the great laboratory full of the crown jewels of American science. This is a pretty unique idea, and very few people outside the laboratory hold this idea. There's no one way to think of Los Alamos Lab, but I want to offer something a little radical that, uh, that you can try on. And sometimes this model works as a behavior predictor and uh, as an alternative model. Los Alamos operates a lot like a criminal syndicate. So, um, Professor Black, who worked on savings and loan fraud, developed a whole theory of control fraud, which uh, basically involves controlling the environment in which fraud can be evaluated so that no one ever sees it. Um, and this is going on in many parts of our society right now, but it's certainly going on in the military industrial complex. And those who have done oversight work relative to the Pentagon and oversight work to Los with respect to the weapons laboratories, they look to the Pentagon as being a paragon of sound accounting, excellent management, and careful use of taxpayer resources. Mm -hmm. If only, they say, the laboratories could be run as well as the Pentagon. We hear this all the time. So the failure of the weapons laboratories and Los Alamos laboratory to produce economic development in the state can only be understood by looking at what it does, how it is funded, and what and what it what it feels it must do to recruit scientists, and all of these non-strictly neoliberal perspectives. So if you have just recently, there was a report from the Bureau of Business and Economic Research about how much money Lionel was spending. Well, this is an example of control fraud. The Bureau of Business and Economic Research used only used data supplied by Lanel. The scope of work was set by Lanel. It was paid for by Lanel. The public relations was done by Lanel. And the anything that was adverse to Lanel's reputation was omitted. So there was nothing there about any social indices, any effects on the labor market, housing markets, all this stuff is that the stuff that really matters for ordinary people in the state was left out. Another aspect of our context that should be said right at the beginning is that we have to decolonize our minds and realize that we actually have a lot of power. Our passivity is what empowers our colonial masters, if you want to put it that way. 
Lionel has had many grand plans in the past. There have been six or eight plans for restarting plutonium pit production since the Rocky Flats plant shut down in 1989. All of these plans have collapsed. They've all been helped to collapse, but they collapsed because of a few fundamental reasons. Lack of need, poor design, uh, poor management, um, opposition. So truth matters, facts matter, morality matters, common sense is an amazing uh, anti-nuclear weapons tool. And people in this room have applied common sense to nuclear proposals from Los Alamos lab for decades and have had a big effect. So the plans are produced within a very small echo chamber. And like any such echo chamber, and it's very self-interested, so there's a lot of self-delusion, a lot of deception of others, it's propagandistic. Um, every, you know, the good news percolates up to the top of the bureaucracy, especially in the Trump administration. Nobody wants to say, we can't do the mission. Um, there are people in the Pentagon who will whip you with a wet noodle if you say, we can't make pits on schedule. So nobody says that, except... It has been now said, and it's in the public domain, so now the agency is sitting on a time bomb, in a way, an intellectual time bomb. Lannell's plans are, we believe, incompatible with human survival and the vision our youth need to face the converging crises of our time. Why incompatible with human survival? It's not just nuclear war. It's that these investments that we're going to hear about are part of an enormous increase in nuclear weapons spending, which in turn is part of an increase in military spending, which is devoted to trying to control most of the world. These priorities are exactly antithetical to environmental protection, climate change mitigation, Green New Deal, social justice, education, everything we need. It's too much money being wasted on a futile endeavor to control places far away. You know, we've got to, got to be, have all these bases, how many bases, several hundred around the world. We have to have these new pieces of military hardware. The nuclear weapons modernization uh, will cost several hundred billion. Over the next 30 years, nuclear weapons are expected to consume somewhere in the vicinity of $1.5 trillion. And if you add in uh, a little more inflation and some environmental cleanup, which is not in that figure, then you get over two trillion dollars. So this all told nuclear weapons, development, deployment, design, testing, production, is a more than, and cleanup, is a more than two trillion dollar endeavor. We can't afford it and we can't, it is incompatible with the aspirations of every local politician in this country for betterment of their community. So I've already said this, we're in a colony. Once upon a time we had this uh, billboard at the airport, and you could see it from a landing airplane. That was fun. Um, next. Yes, um, it's not a coincidence. Next. Uh, this was a random picture we took. Uh, Trish wrote out badges for us, uh, to a hidden meeting. So there was the pen and there was the badge, and so Trish just said, Greg and Trish, and then we walked in. Uh, so this was in the Senate, uh, and uh, there's Ben Gray, and um, Michelle is getting a briefing about the B-6112 uh, high-precision 
uh, gravity bomb. Next. Um, now, talk. Uh, this is about priorities. Um, so, the laboratory told us on August 8th at the subcontractors forum, which you'll hear more about shortly, that they were going to spend $13 billion on capital projects at Los Alamos Lab in the next decade. So here is a comparison with major infrastructure projects you might be somewhat familiar with. So uh, Elephant Butte Dam cost 2% as much as Lanel would like to spend in constant dollars in the next decade. And so on. Uh, even the plutonium facility, the main plutonium facility at Lanel, costs only 2% of what they would like to spend in the next decade. The Golden Gate Bridge, only 8%. So if you have some idea that America is, that there's something broken, uh, this is it. Los Alamos is a black hole for money. Now, if you've got your neoliberal dunce cap on, you will say, oh, well, every dollar spent at Los Alamos is great for New Mexico. <laughs> Wasting money on fiascos is not good for anyone, especially when the fiascos, um, or even if it turns out well, are for weapons of mass destruction. Um, more money than all of the interstates built in the state. Next, please. Um, so, here's what people do at Los Alamos Lab. Um, and so we have R&D. Uh, we've got uh, about 2,400 people and out of 12,000. Next, please. I don't have an up-to-date pie chart on what percent of the money is spent on nuclear weapons, but it's about 70%, and then if you include the very closely allied support functions, it's about 80%. Um, okay, so Los Alamos does nuclear weapons. That's its raison d'etre. That is why it has so much money. Do not get confused and think it's some kind of renewable energy lab or something like that. We hear this in Santa Fe. It is not. It makes nuclear weapons. That is its main purpose and its only reason to have all this money. Next, please. Specifically, when we're talking about plutonium pits, we're talking about plutonium pits for a new warhead for ICBMs in silos. And those are where the silos are. So we are talking about a new warhead for MERV, that's multiple independent reentry vehicle ICBMs that are fielded by the Air Force at those locations. Next. There is a picture of a, a MERV missile. In that case, it's the MX. We don't have a missile that big in the arsenal anymore, thank goodness. Um, there are enough warheads to equip all the missiles we have with all the modern features, um, but the Air Force doesn't want those. Next. Here is um, a Minuteman III with single warhead configuration as it is deployed today. Next. <coughs> this is the skinnier reentry vehicle, which we have, which you could put three on a Minuteman III, but it's not as accurate, and it uses an old warhead, and the Air Force doesn't want to use it anymore. Next. We have, this is uh, over here, um, there are pits stored in Texas, uh, near Amarillo. There are approximately 20,000 extra pits there, of which most are surplus, but about 5,000 pits are being kept as usable spares. Next. Here's the plutonium center of Los Alamos on Pajarillo Road. Um, and uh, this was, this is an older picture. They were going to have modular development there. This is the main plutonium facility built in 1978 um, with its ancillary buildings. 
This is the new R loop, which is now, that building is now the most expensive construction project single building in the history of the state. Um, it's not finished. It won't be finished for a few years. Next. What is pit production? What do you do? You disassemble pits, purify the metal, cast plutonium, machine it, assemble it with other parts, and then <coughs> test it. Next. And here are some pictures for what that looks like on the inside. So we coat the pits so they don't oxidize. Here's the working environment. Next. There is a team, they have made a pit, and it's in that container, but only one or two days after the triumphant picture, they made another egregious criticality violation and the whole place was shut down. Um, anyway, that was their team, A team. Next. The, this is a, these are pictures from Los Alamos. This is an art, not a science. Uh, casting plutonium is tricky. And the work is not easy. It's dangerous and it is, requires a lot of skill and practice. This is a picture of machining a pit in the old Rocky Flats days. Next. Uh, this from Los Alamos, induction furnace, melt the plutonium, goes down um, into the mold, which is there. Next. Then uh, then it's machined. This is same kind of deal, only this picture is at Los Alamos. High precision machining. Next. Again, working environment for making pits. Next. Okay, this is not a clean deal. This is not like a shiny stainless steel um, high-tech thing all the time. This is a dirty process involving a lot of residues and a lot of you know, hitting things with hammers and collecting dirty stuff and recycling this part here and there. And I put this here to um, show you um, that uh, it's not a clean machine. Thank you. This is an old graph. We didn't have time to upgrade it. So Obama wanted to make pits just like Trump, but Obama did not resource it. Those are the yellow bars. But um, Secretary of Defense Mattis went to Trump and said, we need buku money. Trump said, sure. And so this then became the funding curve for plutonium pits. And this is what our delegation is salivating over. That's a lot of money, more than $1 billion a year, just for pits. Um, next, please. Now, there's a certain historical uh, uh, repetition um, in these plans. So these plans, this is from January 1990, that was the proposed plutonium facility in January of 1990. Um, people from Taos filled uh, the high school gym and wrote hundreds of postcards to Senator Bingaman. People from Santa Fe filled the Runnels Building Auditorium Anyway, Senator Bingaman um, put this on ice. Uh, it wasn't really necessary. In this picture, here's the main plutonium facility in the background. And they put this forward six months after Rocky Flats closed. Next. Then, move, uh, move ahead to October uh, 2008. <coughs> here's the main plutonium facility. Here's the R loop which is built. Here is the nuclear facility, which was going to cost at least $6 billion, which was stopped substantially by tackling it by the shoestrings and letting all of its problems catch up with it. Then there's another one, and then there's another one of those. That was for the 80 pit per year mission. So they wanted to uh, double up on the manufacturing at that time. Next. Uh, it was going to have enormous environmental impacts up and down the valley, up and down that. Um, so those, that little uh, green and yellow uh, just are places that would have to be disturbed, torn up, um, turned into parking lots and cement mixers. Next one. And there's another version of this 
Um, so this one building is going to entail all these yellow impacts here. In fact, it was, impacts are going to be all over the laboratory. This waste facility was uh, built, but it was built inadequately and it's only able to function partially. Um, and this is done, redone, but um, the, the liquid waste facility, but the transuranic version is not yet done. Next. So this you don't see every day. Here's um, a current or last year plan for um, the next version at the same place. So there's uh, two above ground, semi above ground modules for manufacturing plutonium pits. Um, connected to, again, the main plutonium facility and the Arlu building through tunnels which would come up like that, underground. Next, please. Here is another plant, also modern. These would be entirely underground. Here are underground modules for, underground factory modules for producing plutonium pits. Now the advantage of an underground module, if you're a Los Alamos lab, is you don't have to, you, you don't have to meet nuclear safety standards because those flow from possible public exposures. So if they're underground, and in the event of a large earthquake, they'll simply be buried. And the, um, earth, the uh, public exposure would be minimal. There is no explicit mandate in law to protect workers at nuclear weapons facilities. Okay. Um, NNSA has serious issues with respect to pit production. They have a lack of serious mission need, bad conceptual design, they have a high cost which is uncertain, poor management, the projects last a long time, um, and oh, facility management and, and project management, and they have fiscal time bombs uh, in the Department of Energy, they have growing programs with no, without a growing budget, there's competition for funds in government, and they have instability of uh, contracts, and they have um, doing all this construction at an active plutonium facility is very hard. And it tends to shut everything down. If it gets shut down for too long, then the people who surveil the arsenal, they, they need data. They want data, and they're not going to get data if the building is shut down. And finally, um, poor morale, they have hiring and retention problems, and it's just a terrible location. Uh, next. Other, um, the, other op the other place that the Department of Energy and NNSA, Na National Nuclear Security Administration, want to make pits is in South Carolina. That um, is the former MOX facility. You, can't really tell exactly how big it is from this picture. Those are cars. It's, um, it's gigantic. It was being built for the purpose of processing ex surplus plutonium pits into nuclear reactor fuel for use in somebody's reactors. There wasn't too much interest in it. It ended up being very expensive and the project was eventually ended. But now we have a gigantic building which, depending on who you ask, is 40% done or 70% done. And it's not contaminated so that it can be modified. Um, and it is very large and it is in the middle of a 310 square mile industrial facility. We don't want pit production anywhere. So that's but. If it had to be done, this is the engineering solution. Next, please. There's a, another view up close earlier in construction. Um, the scale of it, uh, this is about the size of PF4. 
and then there's that. And this is built to modern safety standards, not like PM4. This has got double walls with rubble in between for missile attack. It's got, the NRC was all over this as it was being built. Okay, um, why do we say that industrial pit production is virtually impossible at land? The site is isolated, the topography is dissected, the culture is wrong, There's, they have a problem with institutional arrogance. Underneath the site, there's some very soft sediments. In fact, um, they believe that any large really large building would, um, any really large building might slide off the mesa in the event of an earthquake. Um, the facility was built in uh, 1978 to a lower standard. There are, it depends on other even worse buildings around Lanel, um, and etc. Next please. So let's stop right there for now. And We'll get into the larger issues of what Lanel is planning in the next, next part of the talk. But, um, it was very shocking for us that the lab site planning process now extends far beyond the lab boundary. So they want a road from the top. This is La Bajada escarpment here. From here at about the Waldo exit. This is I-25. Uh, this is I-25 to Santa Fe down here. This is the Santa Fe River Canyon. Then to go down the Santa Fe River Canyon through the Caja del Rio and across the Rio Grande Gorge and connect here at Ancho Canyon with State Route 4 just north of um, Mandalay. Um, and the reason that they want that, as they said, was to cut commute time and to uh, link up better with the labor pool in Albuquerque. They would like to make a transfer from the National Forest for more housing in Los Alamos because they need 1,500 more workers in receiving complex on San Ildefonso land, on Native American land. Um, okay. Uh, uh, here, these blue are brand new buildings they would like to build. Next, please. This is their zoning. The gold is weapons. Um, then su support, support, shared, support, research park. This is not necessarily what it is. Next, please. So they would like a new bridge over the canyon there. And turn the old bridge into like a pedestrian bridge. Next, please. Oh, and a new bypass road. Next, please. Uh, all these new research uh, park buildings, these are multi story parking garages. Next, please. This is the main technical area. Again, a little bit of a close up. Uh, demolition of the existing CMR building, but not the main shops. Park, parking next. Long-term, all those other dark blue buildings. Next, please. Pajarito Corridor, that's the existing. This is the plutonium facility right here, the plutonium area. Next, please. Multi-story parking, multi-story parking. Uh, cafe cafeteria, they don't show, there is one there. Office and training complex. To get a scale of the parking, that's a six, this is the one that says P, is a six-story parking facility, 346 feet on a side. Um, and that's one of three new parking facilities serving the plutonium facility. There, there, and this parking facility they'd like to build on top of the second largest nuclear waste dump at Los Alamos. Next, please. Upgrade the linear accelerator. Next, please. More, uh, more, next, uh, next, more new buildings, next, more, more, um, and they want to eventually tighten up security all over the whole laboratory by moving all 
uh, non-cleared activities off. Next, please. I think that's the end that's of it. it. Okay. Those, that was the lunchtime talk from a site plan which none of us have. That's the $13 billion plan, or at least part of it is $13 billion. I don't really know. Well, here we have um, Native American uh, <coughs> contractors partnering in the big construction project. This is freaking them out. Their uh, accident rates for construction are doubling and tripling just over the last year. And as they explained it, this when this when they have an accident, they have to shut down for a period of time to have investigation. Washington's involved. The plumbers, the pipefitters, and so forth have to get other jobs. Then they lose all the training that they have invested in those people because they need to make a living. The result is an unstable, untrained workforce, and then they have more accidents. And this terrifies the laboratory because it's a vicious cycle that they haven't been able to break. Next, please. This is the only thing on a LANL letterhead we have that, that tells uh, the story of the 13 billion. That stands for a total estimated cost, but there's every project has an overhead, which is in addition to the TEC value. Sorry, it's a little bit nerdy. But so that's the um, 11.2 is what that is what the construction contractors would get. There's another bunch of money that the laboratory would need to and the feds the feds would need to oversee the project, and that adds that's about 13 billion. She said 13 billion. Next, uh, these are architectural uh, renderings of buildings. We don't fully know where they are. Um, office, training, parking, cafeteria. The cafeteria means, um, those of us who've been talking to congressional staff about this, that means multiple shifts at the plutonium facility. They need a, they need a cafeteria. Yeah, they, need, they have to work uh, 24 hours for these deadlines. Two production shifts, one maintenance shift. Next, please. So there's an enormous amount of um, machinery and glove boxes that, have, that they are anticipating uh, replacing. Um, by comparison, making 80 kits a year is uh, said to take 133 glove boxes. So that's more than that. Next, please. They need to have 600 subcontractor craft people on site during the build-out process for um, plutonium pit production. This is all at TA-55. Next, please. They need everything. Next. Can you... Okay. Keep going. Okay, this is slightly interesting. 13 billion compares to 17 billion for the replacement value they show for the entire laboratory. Um, <laughs> the, the Manhattan Project spent, in today's dollars, only $2 billion in New Mexico for the Trinity test and for building Los Alamos, designing the bomb, operating, purifying the plutonium, making the pits, all that, acquiring the land, building the roads, whatever. That only cost $2 billion in today's dollars. And so what we have here is a construction project which is more than six times as great as the entire cost of the Manhattan Project in New Mexico. Um, next, please. This is a special one for Cliff. Uh, this is a roof problem. Uh, they are only spending a million a year on their roofs, um, and that means that their roofs are getting worse and worse every year, and they will have 575 buildings with, uh, with failing roofs in 10 years, um, as opposed to only 200. Um, next, please. So if they spend 10 million, 10 times as much, they can bring their uh, back to life down. Um, the, uh, the point of this is that Los Alamos, and I guess I should have made this point at the previous slide. Could you go back, honey, two slides? One, three, maybe four. There. They have an enormous built plant there that was built during the Cold War. And 
they feel they have to maintain it. They feel that they want to maintain it on the scale of the Cold War. A Trump administration official said to me, the labs are operating at the scale of the Cold War, and they need another Cold War to keep going. So that was the gist of the subcontract reform, which is basically a bunch of mysteries as to why this new management team, which I've got to say, communicates way better than the old management team, why they feel that they're entitled to this much money, and where they think they're going to get it, and what exactly is the plan. But we don't know any of those things. Yesterday we asked the governors, the governor through his her staff person, and we got what seemed to us the runaround. Um, but um, our prime requests to our politicos are for <coughs> transparency and environmental analysis at this point. Those are our prime requests. And they, you don't even have to be against any of this stuff to want that. It's their kind of good government requests. They failed so many times before and there's many indications that they don't know what they're doing really. If they only would just communicate better among themselves and with the public and be forced to understand things on a more fundamental level themselves, then they, if they feel their plans are sound and strong, then they'll be better. We feel that the facts are on our side and they'll fail. And that's why everything is so secret. They're afraid of just how bad this is and how bad it will look. Um, so let's see. So what to do? So transparency. We, have re we ran into yesterday um, the possibility that the lab might want to have some dog and pony shows, as we would call them. So, the uh, night before last in Hemis Springs, the, the community um, was trying to, the, the village council was trying to decide whether to request a site-wide EIS of land. And um, they couldn't uh, come to that conclusion. People from the lab were there, um, retirees and others, and um, Chris Chandler, who's in the legislature, said, well, maybe the lab should have a public meeting about all this. We don't really want a public meeting run by a criminal syndicate. <laughs> we want legitimate government to follow laws, like the National Environmental Policy Act, like the regulations that DOE itself has established for site planning. DOE has facility planning standards. This administration is working over time to try to move as many projects out of the accountable column into the unaccountable column. We, uh, we don't really want um, the contractors who benefit from all of this to hold a forum as if they were impartial arbiters. Mm -hmm. We want government to do it. That's it's part of the problem. Um, and we want a national environmental impact statement, which we are entitled to. And because the impacts are national, and because two sites are involved, one in South Carolina and one here. I should stop, I think. Um, well, maybe a, just a few more ideas of, to answer Jim's question and others. What can we do here? We're sick of the RCLC, as you know, if you've read our stuff. And maybe enough is enough. Um, Geo's Forest Service plan has also has been brought up. Um, that's the Santa Fe National Forest. Not tell that there's a whole series of meetings. There's a whole series of meetings, and we have a list of when and where. 
that from its site. Um, right here. So you can see that right here. Um, the point is, because it's not in the forest plan at all, these roads and this whole expansion, it should be addressed in the forest plan. And people should go to those meetings and say, Where's, where is this in the planning? This can't happen because it's not part of the forest plan. And if you're going to do this, where's the NEPA study that allows you to do it? Because there is no NEPA study. Right. Um, another, something else that's already happened is that a prominent, one of the state's largest Democratic Party donors has called up the senators and said, I'm not giving to you anymore. Not with this stuff going on, and, your, and what you've done in the town. And money talks. Money does talk. And if one, uh, a little project one could undertake is to organize Democratic Party donors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, we have to have some standards. Um, and we have to, this is where it comes back to this context. We're not going to get a Green New Deal. We're not going to get health care for everybody. We're not going to get forgiving student loans or any of these other progressive things while also trying to run a global empire with a nuclear aegis protecting our expeditionary forces around the world. We, that is the, those are contradictory political values and contradictory financial values. And we have to get this message across that don't come to us and tell us how progressive you are and how you're hearing our pain and all of that when you're in the Senate funding all this stuff. And in fact, Senator Heinrich joined with Senator Lindsey Graham, one of the most conservative people in the Senate, to demand that the Trump pit production requirement of 80 pits a year by 2030 which the Pentagon's contractor, the Institute for Defense Analysis, has said is impossible. Heinrich and Graham have an amendment which passed the Senate that would make that 80 pits per year by 2030 a law. And that is uh, probably going to pass the conference committee because Republicans in the House are also in favor of it. Democrats in the House are in favor of doing all the pit production at Los Alamos. A smaller number with a smaller budget, but they, uh, their idea is the Los Alamos compromise, which is that we'll load it into Los Alamos. And that's why Tom Mason, head of Los Alamos Lab, said, oh, we need all this for 30 pits a year, because that's the house Democratic number. So he has said, oh yes, we need all these glove boxes and all these buildings and the new road and you know all that stuff you saw. That's for the 30 pit mission. Um, it's not really true because Los Alamos is under a mandate to plan for 80 pits a year. This mandate came from an amendment that was co-sponsored by Michelle Lujan Grisham, Ben Ray Lujan, and Steve Pierce um, that passed last year. And um, I, I guess I've heard it two or three times in the last day what a nice guy Ben Ray Lujan is, and, but that's not our idea. People, uh, this is a violent set of priorities. This embodies enormous structural violence for ourselves and for the um, just one or two more things. The newspapers need help. Bird dogging candidates is a good idea. Disruption of business as usual. We um, we are coming up to uh, a groundswell identified as the Extinction Rebellion, uh, which we are uh, very feel very positive about. Um, we need. Everyone can take part in articulating an alternative vision for the state that is based on community and social development and really sustainable values. And it's not just another neoliberal scheme that will end up benefiting 
contractors and investors and leave our communities high and dry. We need, now we've got some more uh, personal here, uh, we, um, we want, we're interested in vocations, just like the church. Um, we're interested in full-time help. We are interested in young people. We're interested in helping young people learn and make a big contribution, which we can help with. We, um, serious, uh, being serious means, in part, being full-time. If we had a couple more full-time people, even one more, then we can coordinate more part-time people. We discovered we had entree in Washington, so we're going back, both Trish and I this time, in, in a few more days, um, where we can talk to congressional committees and congressional agencies and others, where we have an excellent entree. And that's a good use of our time, but we have to work on that pretty much a lot of the time. And so the, nobody's talking to environmental groups as they should be talked to, nobody's talking to clubs as they should be talked to, and so on. So those, um, those organizing tasks um, are out there with nobody's name on them. They're not getting done. And uh, what we have found is that when the moment in history is right, um, a small number of people can make a very big difference. And we may well be at that historical moment now. People are pretty bad. So I think I'll close with that, and but, uh, now we can have more discussion, um, and we look forward to um, your contributions now, which again, we take very seriously.